Okay, I think we're live. Uh, this is Todd Enos. I'm the founder and CEO of the Pennsylvania Wild Center for Entrepreneurship. And um, I'm happy everybody's joining us today for the Wilds Are Working series. We have two guests today. Um, we have Josh Helke from Organic Climbing in Phil Phillipsburg and Dana Harrington from the Goat Fort Indoor Climbing Gym in Warren. And um, I'm really excited to have you guys both here today. And this is the first time we've done one of these with two businesses at once, but we thought it was really appropriate. Um, you guys both have uh, climbing businesses. And before we kind of jump into kind of how you're pivoting amid COVID and all of this, uh, I was hoping you guys could talk a little bit. Um, Josh, your, your company, you guys make uh, crash pads, backpacks, clothes, tote bags, sort of related to the climbing industry. Dana, you uh, have an indoor rock gym, uh, climbing gym that focuses on bouldering. And um, I, you know, for the wilds, we've got, you know, 2 million acres of public land here and we're known for outdoor recreation, but I can't say a lot of people probably associate that with climbing. Um, but here we are, we've got two business models around this industry right here based in the wilds. Um, and that's really cool, and it, and it's such a niche. Uh, so I was wondering if you guys could just talk a little bit about kind of the climbing community here in rural PA and um, what you know about them. Dana, maybe we'll have you start, and then Josh, you can you can add to it. Wow. Um, so really, when I think of PA climbing, I think of bouldering, and in my experience, the last you know, 20 years, bouldering is probably the fastest growing segment. Um, Josh may be able to correct me. Um, but it's also one that people don't traditionally think of. When I got started climbing, uh, bouldering wasn't even on my radar. But by virtue of the fact that that's what's that's what's here in PA, it's boulders, uh, over 20 years, it just became what I did. And the, the climbing community is, is, there's so many boulders all across Pennsylvania. Um, I didn't realize that there were plenty of people like me that were just bouldering in their local playgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's only over 20 years that we've slowly, I'm like, I'm, I'm aware of the other climbers in Pennsylvania, but none of us seem to travel outside of our own little areas much. Um, uh, I've only met Josh once before. Uh, I don't think we've ever climbed together. I'm aware of all of the the local players that have been developing boulders over the last 20 years but wow my experience of them has been more virtual than anything else you see youtube videos or something so it was really over 20 years that and it was a slow progression i had a revelation a few years back that wow wow there's boulders in pennsylvania there's real climbing in pennsylvania i've gone for a long enough time thinking that real climbing happened somewhere else right and, and you had a whole uh, following prior to starting your gym. Uh, people, you had sort of a, a gym set up in your um, in your garage and, and had a whole kind of following there of folks that were would come and climb with you prior to leading into your business model. Is that right? It was weird. It started in a barn. <laughs> <laughs> a barn, right. Yeah, that's cool. Holds in an old pole barn. And then that collapsed under snow and ice. So we built... Uh, just a little wall in our garage, which I think is not atypical. A lot of climbers are putting little basement walls up or garage walls up. I think that's that's yeah. part of the bouldering culture. And yeah. over the course of 10 years, there really wasn't any other opportunity. So locals just started showing up at the garage. <laughs> it was a Tuesday night thing. They drive way out to Pittsfield, which isn't on any map. And Josh, what about you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that being centered here is really cool because like Dana said, with the different communities, um, I'm actually from Minnesota and I started climbing when I was four. So I've, I've watched the sport really progress from, you know, for 36 years now. And like, it's been cool to see bouldering come to the forefront. Um, I bet, you know, Dana would agree with this, but when bouldering first started, um, kind of in the late nineties in terms of gaining popularity, I think there were a lot of people like Dana and I who were at high school, you know, in high school at the time and probably getting a little bit sick of the the mainstream aspect of rock climbing and the cost of it um, and started to see the counterculture aspect of the bouldering. Um, it was almost like skateboarding to our generation. Um, and I would say as, as a business, so this is our 16th year of business, I've, I've seen bouldering go from 
this counterculture company that really, I guess, created what organic climbing is in terms of one of a kind kind of art artistic products, um, mm -hmm. but we do it at an industrial scale to now a sport that's, you know, in the Olympics for the first time and like really mainstream. Uh, yeah. so it's been it's been crazy because back in high school, I never would have thought I could make a living off of it, let alone support, you know, a local community of employees. Um, and now to have this sport that has blossomed and become a real sport um, and, and to have watched it go through an unprecedented time globally, like with the pandemic, um, I work with everybody from, you know, Dana and like the climbing gym aspect of it to people who mostly yeah. climb outdoors. Um, and it's just been crazy to watch how resilient our community and our sport is. Um, That's cool. As businesses, so. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about um, sort of your businesses. Uh, so why did you decide to start your business? And we'll start with you on this one, Josh, and go over to you, Dana. Why did you decide to start your business, you know, back when you did? And for Dana, I know it was a little more recently for you. Um, and then uh, what have been sort of the benefits to um, doing that on a rural landscape like ours? I'm really curious always to talk to entrepreneurs about that, um, you know, cost of living or shipping or, you know, just as a, as a place to place a business um, or even access to the outdoors. I don't know. What are, you, what are your thoughts on it? Sort of give us your story. Well, I so yeah, I started because uh, my wife's a geology professor at Penn State, and when I actually have a history degree um, to be a history teacher, um, but when we were out in Laramie, Wyoming, it was the first recession, like the 2000s, um, and I couldn't get a teaching job because it's a small town, and people didn't really want to hire someone they saw as possibly transient. You know, going to be there a couple of years and move yeah. on. Um, a lot like State College in that it, it's just like a town used to that. Uh, so I was working in a local machine shop that made rock climbing little metal protection for the rope climbing um, and kind of sponsored on the side for, for bouldering. Um, and I was doing some product design um, within the rock climbing world. And that's when uh, there was a company that entered the market that was making really cheap crash pads. Um, and then every product that I was designing for bouldering ended up going from like the classic outdoor like durability aspect of it. And then it just got super cheap and it could became a price war. Um, and we would spend most of our summer in Utah, like out in the field doing geology research for my wife and I would climb in the evening. So we would just trash the gear that we were designing for other companies. Um, mm -hmm. And we had seen the culture. Um, my family's all artists. So I was always really attracted to manufacturing and like the making of stuff. Um, so we'd, we'd watch these like these production shops that maybe had surfers working in them in Oregon or other places in the summer. And then in the off season, they'd close, but they'd have made product all year. So there was this culture of making stuff that got completely lost when it all got exported. So I just ended up falling in love with that. Um, and from a, from a, like a rural standpoint, I have a unique experience because I'm from Minnesota. So I actually moved my business back from Laramie, Wyoming, which is very rural like the Pennsylvania wilds to mm -hmm. Minneapolis for two years and was in the heart of a big city, then moved again out to rural Pennsylvania. Um, yeah. And I would say that the price of doing things in the rural area and the accessibility of, you know, being able to go out our back door and product test um, and also just yeah. having a, a place where you can, especially in an economic climate like now, where you might be able to attract people who want that same standard of living where you have a good yeah. job, you get to make stuff, but it's relaxed and you're not hustling as hard just to pay your rent. Um, right, right. And there's a culture of making stuff throughout some of these small mountain towns. Um, absolutely. And we love that. Yeah, absolutely. That's really cool that um, just that, that, that space of, uh, you know, people that do the activity that they're yeah. Providing the product or service for there's such a difference to me when I deal with businesses that it's a passion of theirs, like yours is for climbing, and then you make these climbing products versus somebody that's just doing it, you know, as a product and you know trying to get it to market. And there just isn't that that ground truth that comes up from actually using things and understanding how they could be improved because you go out there and test them in the field and things. So yeah. that's just so cool that background. Um, and uh, Dana, what about uh, what's your story here? So, so 
uh, when did you guys start? Why did you decide to do it? And um, how has, you know, your thoughts on sort of operating in a rural place? Uh, you know, I think honestly, this is my midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, over 20 years of climbing, 20 plus years now, um, I found the vast majority of that early on was about my personal exploration. Uh, it was it was an experience that was motivated by, you know, my ego. It's what I wanted to do. Um, and then I found myself, you know, married, kids, job, with a little bouldering wall in my garage, and people were coming over. And there was this transformation, I think, that probably is normal for people where I would set problems and then when people would come out to climb on a Tuesday night, I would sit on this nasty old futon in the garage and watch people climb. And it was so much fun to see what happens when you create that space, to see that, you know, this is where people would, they were just jonesing for Tuesday night to come out and climb in my little garage. And you know, of course I daydreamed about a rock climbing gym before then, but it was more because I wanted a gym. And I got to a point where I saw an opportunity for me to take this space that we'd created and to do it on a larger scale and make it more available to a bigger community, even though Warren's pretty tiny anyway. And that was really the motivation. I saw it as, as uh, to steal the, uh, the, I think it's a real estate phrase uh, when you're talking about properties, the highest and best use of a property. I, got, I came to the point where I felt like that this is my highest and best use. This is the, the best use of me and my talents and my experience for my community. Uh, and then my wife and I, after you know, considering how it would upset our lives, to say, you know what? You may as well go for it. And the motivation to do that, I think, was important. Had I tried to do a climbing gym earlier on, I'm not sure it would have been successful because it would have been driven by what my needs were personally. And I think that being driven by the greater community has allowed this to be successful. For Pete's sake, if it wasn't for the greater community, this wouldn't happen. This isn't something that just an individual does. It really takes a community to put something like this together. Yeah. Uh, I think it was just a natural outgrowth of, of where I've been in life. Um, I think I answered your question. <laughs> no, you did. It was great. It was a great answer. Um, you guys are just the real deal. I love it uh, because, the, you know, when you're talking about we deal with this on a regional scale, of course, trying to grow the outdoor rec economy. And so much of it is about, you know, it starts it's a lifestyle. You know, these businesses are there's a passion behind it and uh, there's a whole sort of culture around each niche of it. And uh, when it comes to outdoor rec and, and you guys, you guys are just the real deal. And it's just so cool to see it happen in here in rural PA. Um, so t let's talk a little bit about, I uh, want to pivot a little bit to talk about COVID and sort of how this is, um, you know, impacting you guys and your operations. So Josh, on yours, um, you know, what we've seen in rec in general, uh, since this whole thing started, you know, they're talking about in May, it was, there was 40% increase in, in state park attendance. You're seeing very aggressive use of trails and outdoor rec. There's the sales of kayaks and bikes. And, you know, you've kind of seen the national stories. They're happening statewide um, as well. So outdoor rec is booming. Um, I'm just wondering uh, in the climbing community, uh, for, for somebody who's making products, a rec product, how have you guys, are you guys seeing the same kind of trends? Do you have numbers that sort of show from last year to this year, same time frame? Um, how is it impacting kind of your product lines in your company? Yeah, it's been it's really been almost a tornado. Um, so full disclosure, we also, we do organic climbing. Um, we also have a newer brand that organic climbing owns and produces called Nittany Mountain Works. That's more general outdoors. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm going to bring Nittany Mountain Works into the picture a little bit. Um, sure, please. So earlier in the year, we were at 24 employees um, and then COVID hit and we really worked to keep everybody on. We actually um, got an exemption to make masks. So we, we made PPE moved a lot of people into like their garages and kind of got them set up to do that kind of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, and Dana, I'm sure will speak to this. What ended up happening for us is we had about probably three quarters of our employees we had brought on to help keep up with like the mass production of smaller items, like the bags that hold chalk and the tote bags and stuff that people use in the rock climbing gyms. 
Well, obviously with fitness centers, a lot of them still being shuttered, um, we've seen a complete loss of all that business. But the, the, the golden side of it is that those gyms that were selling those, they were like $10 items, um, so a lot of smaller items that we were making in bulk. But a lot of climbers are so passionate that they ended up going outside to the parks. So they're in, they're buying our crash pads, which are like foam gymnastics mats with bouldering or with shoulder straps on them. Um, and, and we make them all to order. So we've really had to completely like shift our whole production setup to take into consideration making a lot of little items to making a lot of these very large items that just take up space. Um, and they're a lot more physical to make. But we, we've, I feel like we've won the game because we were able to really quickly pivot and do that because of our skill set, our local employees, um, and the fact that, you know, we have our own factory right here. Um, there's a lot of, you know, literature out there right now, like media about like the bikes, how there aren't any bikes to buy and stuff. And that's because it's all coming in from overseas. Um, mm -hmm. We do it all in house. So we were able to pivot in, in a day really and just retrain people. We have this super high skill base here in the Pennsylvania wilds of textile workers and just show them how to do these other items. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, full disclosure, we, we do have a few people that are still laid off that we don't have work for, but we were able to retain most of our, our people because we shifted and started, you know, making the bouldering pads instead of the little chalk bags. Um, yeah. We've also seen remarkable growth in the Nittany Mountain Works line just because a lot of other bike accessories, um, we make bags that strap on bikes um, are, are made overseas and bike shops are coming to us because we are still producing them like as right. they, um, and we have an infinite stock because we can turn our fabric rolls into whatever product is, is needed instead of having it pre-made somewhere else. Um, and Josh, do you think, um, you know, when this comes out, you know, in, in rec terms in 2008, you know, after the recession, uh, we saw a big jump in, you know, state park and forest attendance and things like that. And that bump stayed, right? Yep. And they're seeing a similar bump now in rec and everybody's sort of talking about this is probably going to stay too. Yep. Um, do you see a similar sort of thing with your client or your, your customer base that, you know, they've sort of switched from some of these smaller vendors have switched from sort of sourcing overseas. Now they're sourcing with you because they, they have to. And are you expecting that bump to stay? Are you hoping that bump stays? Um, sort of it, new customers coming on. It's, it's a really great question. Um, I will say that yes to both of those. Um, the one thing that we've seen are a lot of the big box stores that customers are traditionally used to purchasing from kind of getting themselves in a corner and trying to bring their strong arming tactics of treating businesses how they do to get the prices they do. And yeah. we don't take that because we don't need to. And I think that we're going to see a big shift in that demographic of people buying and they're going to be doing a lot more direct to consumer purchasing between the business and the, um, the consumer. And I think that yeah. this is a reason we're, we're pretty big proponents of like, getting a uh, high-speed internet infrastructure into rural Pennsylvania because- You like, and me both. <laughs> that, that, that's fundamentally what's allowing us to do what we do and bring jobs yeah. to Phillipsburg and to keep jobs here is because yeah. we, we can do it. Um, but we're just a hop, skip and a jump from Penn State. So the infrastructure is is here. Yeah. Uh, but like, I think that what I'm seeing from customers and, and we are, we love being where we are because we're just a few miles off I-80. So we have a ton of people that come by from New York on their way wherever um, to, to visit and people really fall in love with the area. And I mean, I know we have a lot of people coming, you know, through from Canada who come down, um, you know, and then they buzz up to, to Warren and to go up to the Allegheny National Forest and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm seeing a, a trend of a lot of people you know, our age that have young families that are coming, falling in love with these areas because they have fallen in love with a sport or it's become a part of their life. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see a big a movement of people coming to areas to settle. And I think having like the organic climbing or the goat for, you know, I think that for people that maybe are used to having their rock gym to go work out at moving to Warren, if they can work remotely on their computer with with internet um you know then they have that that love of climbing in the winter what they have there and then same down here it's like maybe they work in the outdoor industry in boulder or somewhere 
at a bigger city that they're just getting priced out of and the thought of coming and working somewhere where you can get a, a really sweet house with a lot of acreage for 50 or $60,000. Yeah, exactly. You get it off in a year or two. Like that, that to this generation sounds good because I think that a lot of people mm -hmm. have, you know, they've been through a lot in a short period of time financially and the ups and the downs. So the security of being somewhere that makes you happy, mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a lot more change. And people people that grew up in these towns, not, not leaving as much. I think they're going to stay if there's like cool things and cool places to work. Um, yeah. So I think we need to focus on that as, as, as leaders in the communities. Yeah. That is definitely one of the things we've always talked about with the wilds work and the effort to grow outdoor rec is that it really does help to make our communities more competitive um, yep. in terms of uh, population retention, worker retention, attracting talent, you know, those sorts of things for the major employers there, for the small businesses there. Um, and I think it's it's like you say, it's the rec assets, it's some of the rec businesses, you know, that, that mix of uh, the vibrant downtowns and stuff. And, you know, our, our region has seen it. it. It's been a tough go these last couple of decades. We've seen, I mean, in Warren County, I think we've, we're on our sixth decade of, of population loss. Yep. And, um, you know, this is a, there's a lot of chatter right now, post COVID, you know, that this really is, uh, could be a moment for, um, you know, really being able to, put a stop to that population decline as people, like you're saying, uh, start to give rural another look and say, hey, wait a second, there's a great quality of life that you can have there and a low cost of living. And um, and if there's good jobs um, and and companies, you know, that they can go to and, and a whole startup sort of entrepreneurial kind of mentality around it, I think really helps too, because entrepreneurship is a real path back to um, your hometown. You know, we've seen that again and again for folks uh, that are coming. Um, well, uh, Dana, let's talk about your business model. You are in a completely different uh, situation owning an indoor gym. That's one of the toughest, you know, models, whether it's rock climbing or any other kind of indoor gym. Those are some of the toughest models that we're seeing business models uh, going through this crisis. I and mean, I think, you know, restaurants are really, are really tough too, but as an indoor gym, um, kind of what are you, what, what has been the impact on you and you were a startup. So that was the other thing. You were literally opening your doors the week this whole thing broke and weren't, weren't able to open. Um, so anyways, tell us a little bit about how you've pivoted, how you've uh, managed. I know you talked a little bit about, you know, you're part of a, a national group of uh, it, rock gyms. So you've been able to get some intel there about how best to manage. But, you know, give us a, a snapshot of what you've been through here. Uh, yeah, the Climbing Wall Association has been a really valuable asset. We have uh, weekly calls, and it's really great to be able to get the perspective of other gym owners across the country. Uh, for us, it's been interesting, though, because pivoting, we really, we had a business model. Um, and to Josh's point, your ability to just take in new data and change uh, is, is crucial. But we weren't stuck in any kind of rut. We hadn't opened yet. We didn't have any kind of habits to break. So just keeping an eye on what's going on, coordinating with other climbing gyms and doing the best you can. I mean, I have to be honest, the best move I've made so far is not to quit my day job. <laughs> um, we've been very blessed. We have, we've got a great community. Um, we're being cautious. We don't have any rope climbing, uh, but the business model was bouldering anyway. Um, and education. I think one of the pieces that that's important here in Warren, we, we really don't have a climbing community. We don't have a population that really has an understanding of the evolution that's taken place. Most people, when they think of climbing here locally, they think about someone who's on a rope, climbing a cliff face. The idea of bouldering as a sport, um, it's, it's still so foreign and new that part of what we're doing is just educating people. Uh, it's been fantastic. The people that have come into the gym and said, I cannot believe when I heard about this, I assumed this was in Erie. This is in Warren. And for them to understand that they, you know, they come in with that, that hesitation of, wait, there's no rope. There's, I'm not, I'm not strapped into anything, mm -hmm. but then with a proper orientation, getting an idea of experience, walking away with this brand new awakening of what bouldering is. 
And then the step beyond that is to say, well, did you know that you're sitting in the Allegheny National Forest where there are thousands of boulders here? This isn't just an indoor activity. And I think it's been beneficial for us or it will be beneficial for us, the fact that there is so much outdoor rec and we're really the only indoor complement to that. There's yeah. plenty of places in the national forest, there's mountain biking, there's bouldering, there's, you know, there's so much, but it's the A&F. So there's 30% chance of some precipitation daily. <laughs> right. I've been, I've been in the woods on a day where I was guaranteed a just 0% chance of rain and been dumped on. That's, that's the A&F. And to have an indoor option that yeah is appealing to a variety. It's not just climbers. There are people who love hiking and backpacking and camping and paddling that see indoor bouldering as a fun option to complement the other outdoor rec activities. So I think that that's gonna be a boon for us as well. But the impact of COVID, I don't have anything to compare it to. We weren't open. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there's, there's an aspect of always, I don't wanna say always looking on the bright side, but with this, there has also been opportunity. It's not that COVID has only had a negative impact. COVID mm -hmm. has changed things. And with change, you have to change with that. And that change includes opportunity. Josh was speaking about opportunity. They're making more crash pads. You know, making sure that you have a, a, a window into the change that's going on around you and being able to pivot, I think, is key. Dana, it was really interesting. Um, Friday, we had a customer pickup from New York City who came, got their crash pads, and the daughter uh, had your book, and they were asking me all the info on rim rocks and all these different areas. And yeah, I bouldered up there a couple times, but not nearly as much as you. Um, and it was so cool to see this like symbiotic, like they were coming to organic climbing, then driving two hours up to go climb. And I couldn't help but think how important it's going to be to have the gym there because like people, you know, they actually texted me a couple of times because they, they went like the wrong way at Rimrock instead of going around the front down to all the boulders, they were like off straight down the stairs and they, uh, to, to have that local knowledge there that's shared with the local community. And I think the exposure of it, but just to have those centers of community too, like if I came up, hadn't, you know, had the experience navigating the woods to actually have the comfort of going somewhere that can give you that information is going to be yeah. such a critical thing. And we're seeing that down here with bike shops, like people coming from New York or Philly wanting to go mountain biking or gravel biking and just getting these maps from Purple Lizard maps and, you know, here locally um, because we're sharing this knowledge, but it's only bettering um, the, e the economics of the area. People go to a local right. restaurant, you know, and, and buy their food afterward. Um, so I think having these pillars in the community of, promoting these, you know, beacons of the recreation, if you will, I think is so important. It is, yeah. it provides an infrastructure. There aren't, I didn't realize that not everybody's wired the way I am. Yeah. I'm okay uh, being dropped in the middle of the wilderness and yep. wandering around with a map and compass and looking for boulders and being lost all day long. Yep. I'm not sure that's typical or normal. Nope. And to your point, having these pillars, these resources, the infrastructure that can support a broader subset of people in these activities, um, I always thought sitting in my garage climbing that, man, if we had a climbing gym yep. or guidebook that could support a larger community. And I think that we're starting to see that growth here in Warren. Yeah, it's so it's so cool to hear you guys talk about this. We talk about them as anchors in the wilds, um, you know, anchor anchor businesses, anchor centers, places that you can go to get that real ground truth as you're trying to, because, you know, when you look at the wilds, it's a huge block of green, right? One of the biggest blocks of green between New York City and Chicago. And that sounds really beautiful, but it's also really intimidating, you know, if you're not from here. And the people that help visitors and residents access that kind of space, that kind of rec, uh, those waterways, the trails, the, you know, the boulders are the outfitters that have that ground truth of, you know, really doing that activity themselves, serving that whole community of folks. And it, it's, it's just not anything you can get anywhere else. And, and we do see that we, we, you know, you can almost identify them in each County, like, okay, this is who you need to go talk to about this because they have that kind of information that's so helpful to, to, and to, 
it's really fascinating too to hear your story, Josh, about um, the person coming in from New York because this is kind of what you know what the idea is with the Wilds is you know people come in and they spend a couple of days here and they you know they move around from place to place they leave some money behind in the communities um and it's just it's so cool because that's exactly what you're talking about somebody comes in from new york city they go to your business they go up to dana's you know they've got his book i mean it's just it's just great to hear of uh the moving around like that uh that we are so um i know we're we're pushing up against our time here so i wanted to um ask you guys, you know, as you're uh, been going through everything, transitioning like you have, um, any organizations, individuals, approaches that have been really programs that have been really helpful to you that you want to mention? I, we work a lot with the Pennsylvania Industrial Development Association, PETA, um, and they've been really instrumental. Like our, our whole factor here is solar powered, which has brought a lot of like- Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, sustainable yeah. like focus because it's, the first known fully solar powered sewing factory um, in the world. And that's not something that people like advertise. So maybe it's not the only one, but like, you know, for our community, it's brought like a lot of focus from international people. Um, so I think that that, and, and in general, uh, so last week, the secretary from the DCNR um, gave yeah. a little symposium here at Organic Climbing just to talk about organic rep. So I think I think that I would really like to, to send a shout out to the to the, the current administration, because I think we're doing a good job of trying to, to to focus a little bit less on the extractive aspect up here and a little bit more about what we have at our fingers to work with and the sustainable nature of some of the you know economic stuff that that we can let roll. Having having spent a decade in Wyoming, um, which is so similar to here in terms of natural spaces, outdoor opportunities, I just see that as a huge thing that our state is really focusing on and needs to keep focusing on even after COVID because we don't have a lot of money after all the unemployment, but if we keep funding the parks and keeping these opportunities open, I think it's really going to pay off in the long term for yep. business. Okay. Dana? Uh, you know, good neighbors, Allegheny Outfitters, having that experience locally in this industry has been, oh my goodness, without Piper, and in the wild, uh, just being being aware of things that in, until you've in, jumped into this world of entrepreneurship, you just don't know. So they're they're the local family here. They're the local family that's been that, done that, and and has really been able to help shepherd me into the unknown. And really, the Climbing Wall Association has been great, uh, just keeping me abreast of the greater indoor climbing world and trends and issues and how to think about things. Uh, that's been a really valuable resource, uh, having not been able to operate. You know, I hit the ground with an idea. Uh, my last, you know, professional experience in indoor climbing is 15 years old. So mm -hmm. being able to hit the ground running with those kind of resources has been, has been amazing. Well, um, to wrap up here, I uh, want to talk about uh, where can people find you guys uh, online, virtually? Where can they find your products? Josh, why don't you start? Um, and then Dana will go to you. Yeah, our products are available um, online with organicclimbing.com and okay. midtimountainworks.com. When there's not a pandemic, we actually have a storefront here um, where people can come and you know see stuff locally and do a shop tour. We don't have that right now, but you know, hopefully this passes at some point in our existence and, and we can reopen that again. So that's just in Phillipsburg. Cool. Okay. Dana. So let me, I, I wanted to have an opportunity to, to mention this. So I'm going to take 30 seconds here. Okay. Yeah, please do. I wanted to ask you, um, I've been climbing for a long time, almost exclusively bouldering, and I haven't seen outside of organic things like blubber pads and load straps and being a being a boulderer for 20 years, especially around here with un, uneven landing surfaces, I feel like organic has really, you have products that boulders need and want that other companies just can't. If I wanna level a landing zone, really make it safe, I can't think of another product somewhere else. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to tell me, am I wrong? Is, are these innovations that organic came up with 
I believe they are, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, we use our products and I think we're not just out there trying to sell stuff. So I think we make stuff that we figure out we need when we're out climbing and then go home and make it. And I think that that is what kind of keeps us at the forefront of the industry. And we're always copied and you'll see it two years later by other companies, but we we take pride in that. And But I think that that, again, we can do that because we can take the risks because of where we are and having a little bit more financial breathing room, if you will. <laughs> so it'll like do that. As a climber, that organic is really not just another company making crash pads, but they're actually innovating. So I, I wanted to take that opportunity to make sure I was right in my thinking here. It's just the blubber pad itself. Yeah, thank you. We try. It's amazing. Thank you. Well, the Pennsylvania Wilds is lucky to have you guys. That's for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, Dana Harrington from the Goat Fort. And we can, what's your web address, Dana? Goatfort.com. Goatfort.com. And Josh Helke from Organic Climbing. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks.